Hello everyone, welcome to this new message. As we are in the habit of doing, let's commit this time to the Lord before we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Once again, your word is truth. And we give you thanks for it. I pray and ask that you would grant your Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth as we read your word today and study it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, brothers and sisters, as I said, welcome to this new message. Turn with me, if you will, to our text for today, which is Hosea chapter 3. Hosea chapter 3. This is the third in the series on this book. And we will read it together. Hosea chapter 3, verse 1. Here we go. Hosea chapter 3, verse 1. Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman, beloved of her friend, and yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord towards the children of Israel who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. So I bought her to me for fifteen pieces of silver, and for a homer of barley, and half homer of barley. And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man. So will I also be for thee. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king and without a prince and without a sacrifice and without an image and without an ephod and without teraphim. Afterwards shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Praise God for the reading of his word. Well, that's a short one, brethren. Now this third chapter of Hosea is very short, as you can see, and it's in fact one of the shortest chapters in the Bible. There are quite a few short psalms, and uh, chapter 10 of Esther is quite short, but this is one of the shortest in the Bible. However, though it's short in length, it is nevertheless still very powerful. And it's powerful, I believe, in two aspects. Two aspects. Number one, it's important and it's, it's powerful in revealing the absolute depravity of the people of God i.e. the ten northern tribes called Israel. Number two, it's powerful in the unfailing love and mercy of God. It's powerful in exposing or revealing to us through the word the unfailing love and mercy of God for his chosen people. Now as we go through these five short verses, please keep in mind that God never changes, brethren. God never changes. And I encourage you to write that down somewhere. Put it on your refrigerator or somewhere in the kitchen, on a door somewhere. God never changes. There's no hint of darkness that is deception or malice or crookedness in God. 1 John 1 5 says the following. 1 John chapter 1 verse 5 says this. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God always means what he says, brethren. Now, let's read Psalm 
138. Verse 2. Psalm 138. Verse 2. I will worship toward the holy temple. Thy holy temple, sorry. And praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above thy na- all thy name. Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Next, God is a jealous God. Turn with me now to Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5. We'll read together. Exodus 20, verse 5. Let's read together, brethren. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Next, you cannot play the fool with God. Turn with me now to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. We'll read this together, brethren. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. You cannot play the fool with God. Here we are. Let's read together. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Be not deceived. Underline that, brethren. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. These are unchangeable characteristics and facets of the Lord God Almighty, brethren. So then, brothers and sisters, now that we have established these unchangeable facts about Almighty God, let us begin our study on this third chapter of Hosea, keeping in mind that what was true for Israel then is also true for the people of God today. God's chosen people. Okay, let's begin. Now I've called this section, or whatever you might call it, a subheading that could be added to this study, and that being a parable by Almighty God. Yeah, I, I would like to think of this as a, a subheading to this to the title of this message, the title being, if you remember, Hosea chapter 3, simply. But I would like to add a subheading to this particular study, this short five-verse chapter, and that being a parable by Almighty God. For that's indeed what it is, brethren. That's exactly what this chapter is. It's a parable by Almighty God. And hopefully you will see the truth of this as we continue through this study. Therefore, let's get on to the first verse. Let's read together again. Hosea chapter 3 and verse 1. Let's read out together to refresh our memories. Hosea chapter 3 verse 1. Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, Love a woman, beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord towards the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. Now God here once again speaks to Hosea, this time instructing him to go yet, or go again, depending on which translation you were using. I'm reading as I usually do from the King James but you may have another version the American Standard or the NIV or whatever. So we can either say go yet or go again. At this point in time Goma if you remember Hosea's prostitute wife appears to have gone astray. She is at this time as we see from the verse we've just read, verse 1, at the home of another man. 
as the scripture puts it, she is beloved of her friend. Beloved of her friend. The words of her friend are one Hebrew word, which is raya, raya. Now this word means the following. It means an associate, more or less close. A brother, a companion, a fellow, a friend, a husband even, a lover, a neighbour or something else. We will give Goma the benefit of the doubt here and not say she is incestuously with her brother, but rather she is with a new husband or a new lover. In any way, God now sees her as an adulteress, according to verse 1. This, brethren, squares with the confirming scripture reference that we read in the study of the previous chapter, chapter 2. If you'll remember, they were from the mouth of Jesus himself, and they are as follows. Matthew chapter 5 verse 32, Matthew 5 verse 32, and also Matthew 19 verse 9. I'll read them together. Matthew 5, verse 32. The words of Jesus. But I say unto you, that whomsoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whomsoever shall marry her, that is divorced, committeth adultery. Now Matthew Chapter 19, verse 9. These are, remember brethren, these are the words of the Lord Jesus himself. Next we have Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, to refresh our memories. Verse 9. And I say unto you, whomsoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whomsoever marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. I think that really clears up that point, doesn't it? Hosea is told to do this as it's according to the love that God has for Israel. He's told to go and fetch Gomer once again, to bring her back to him. In other words, Hosea is taking his wife Gomer back to himself. And that is reflecting the love that God has for the people of Israel, the ten tribes. Even though Gomer is an adulteress at this time, married to Hosea but off with another man, Hosea is told to go and fetch her back to him. And this is reflecting the love that God has for Israel. Even though they, at the last part of the verse, who took other gods and love flagons of wine. And you know, brethren, reading that last part of the verse, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine, it's something common for idolatry and sensuality to go together. You quite often see that especially in the old testament if you remember a baal worship um at the foot of mount sinai they made the calf didn't they and they got drunk and uh, were carousing with one another before moses came down and rebuked them so idolatry and sensuality quite often go together and an excess of wine or strong drink will always loosen inhibitions to both. As the Apostle Peter puts it in the following scripture, 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 3, 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 3, for the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. 
That's from the Apostle Peter. Now we progress to the second verse of this chapter as follows. Let's, let's read together Hosea chapter 3 verse 2. Let's read it together, brethren. Hosea chapter 3 verse 2. Here we go. So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for an homer of barley and an half homer of barley. In other words, for a homer and a half of barley and 15 pieces of silver. Now, brethren, this seems like a strange thing for Hosea to do, doesn't it? As he's already married Gomer. He therefore had already paid the bridal price or price or the dowry uh, to her father. However, we'll break this down into two parts for ease of explanation. I hope, anyway. First of all, the price of 15 shekels or 15 pieces of silver. It was actually half of the price usually paid for a slave. 15 shekels or 15 pieces of silver was half of the price usually paid for a slave. To see the truth of this, turn with me, if you will, to Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21. And verse 32, we're looking here for the price usually paid for a slave. Exodus 21 verse 32, let's read together. If the ox shall push a manservant or a maidservant, he shall give unto their master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. Now 30 shekels of silver or 30 pieces of silver was the price for a slave, a maidservant or a manservant. So 15 shekels was half the price. You see the truth there. Next, barley. Now what was barley for? Barley was used as an offering for one taken in adultery. Look at me, look with me, sir. Not look at me, you can't look at me. Look with me, if you will, to the following scripture. Numbers chapter 5, verse 15. Numbers chapter 5, verse 15. Let's read it together. Numbers chapter 5, verse 15. Then shall the man bring his wife unto the priest, and he shall bring her offering for her, the tenth part of an ephah of barley meal, he shall pour no oil upon it, nor put frankincense thereon, for it is an offering of jealousy, an offering of memorial, bringing iniquity to remembrance. Now then, I need to explain something here. The price here was a tenth part of an ephah. Now that works out to 2.2 litres. 2.2 liters here in hosea he gave a homer and a half of barley now that works out to 330 liters now as you can see hosea gave a much larger amount than was necessary for an offering for adultery now one possible answer to this is that according to the following scripture, one ephah of barley was worth one shekel. Now turn with me, if you will, to see this in 2 Kings chapter 7 verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 7 verse 1. Let's read it together. 2 Kings chapter 7 verse 1. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Okay, now let's do some mathematics here, or as Americans will say, let's do some math here. It's only a short one, so don't be afraid. 
I want to explain these quantities and what they mean. Now, one homer works out to 220 litres. Therefore, one and a half homers, as we read in Hosea, one and a half homers given by Hosea is 330 litres, one and a half. Okay? Now, one ephah is 22 litres. 22 litres. So, 300 divided by 22 is 15. If you remember, one ephah was equal to a shekel. One ephah of barley in the scripture that we read was equal to one shekel. So therefore, 300, and th 300 divided by 22 is 15, which makes 15 shekels. Therefore, three, sorry, 330 divided by 22 is 15 shekels. So then if we take the 15 shekels given in silver plus this 15 shekel value of barley, we have the full price of a slave. Now that took a long way around to get to that point, but that's basically what it means. To prove that this was the half the price of a slave that Hosea gave. This, of course, is only a suggestion. That makes up the 30 shekels, if you remember. So the, the amount of barley that Hosea gave, in addition to the 15 shekels of silver, made up the full price of a slave. That's really what I wanted to get over. I know it's been a long way around and it got complicated, but there we are. This, of course, is only a suggestion and it's only one option. There are others. It would, though, serve as a humiliation to Goma to give the price half, to give the price of a slave and hopefully aid her in leading her back to repentance but also to prove that Hosea was serious about having her back. Do you see what I mean? He gave, with the silver and with the barley, the full price of a slave. So it proved to both humble Goma, but also prove that he was so willing to have her back. Remember, remember brothers and sisters, this situation between Hosea and Goma is meant to reflect the relationship between God and, in this case, the ten northern tribes, making up the then nation of Israel. OK, now we come to verse 3. Let's read together. Hosea chapter 3, verse 3. Reading together. And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for many days, for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man. So will I also be for thee. Let's read it again. And I said unto her, this is Hosea speaking to Gomer, Thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man. So will I be for thee. Hosea now speaking to Goma, and he says to her, Thou shall abide, which is actually, again, one Hebrew word, yashav, yashav. And that word literally means to sit, to stay or to dwell. He says she is to sit for me many days, which may possibly refer to the instructions given to God's people for marrying a woman who is a captive from a war or a battle. Now this is covered in the next 
portion of scripture I want us to read. Let me read, the, read this again because it's important that you understand this. How, uh, Hosea says to Goma that she is to sit many days with him or to stay many days with him. Now, this could possibly refer to the instruction given to God's people for marrying a woman who is a captive from a war or a battle. Now, to see this, we're going to read Deuteronomy chapter 21 from verse 10 to verse 14. Deuteronomy chapter 21 verses 10 to 14. Let's read together from verse 10. When thou goest forth to war against thine enemies, and the Lord thy God hath delivered them into thy hands, and thou hast taken them captive, and seest among the captives a beautiful woman, and hast a desire unto her, that thou wouldst have her to thy wife, then thou shalt bring her home to thy house, and she shall shave her head, and pare her nails, and she shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her, and shall remain in thine house, and bewail her father and her mother a full month. And after that thou shalt go in unto her, and be her husband, and she shall be thy wife. And it shall be, if thou have no delight in her, then thou shalt let her go, whether she will. But thou shalt not sell her at all for money. Thou shalt not make merchandise of her, because thou hast humbled her. Now I want you to underline a portion in verse 13, Deuteronomy 21, verse 13, where it says, And she shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her, and shall remain in thine house, and bewail her father and her mother a full month. Now that's pertinent to us. Here in verse 13, we have our word yeshav, yeshav, for and shall remain. It's what we read in our scripture in Hosea. But also a term of a full month before she could be taken as a wife physically or sexually. This was to be, in both cases, a type of fasting, if you will, a fasting from self. It was to be a time of restraint from sexual pleasure, really, for the man in, in our section in Deuteronomy, but for Goma in our text in Hosea. Do you understand? Amongst other things, of course. Hosea, at the end of verse 3, is including himself in this time of abstinence. The point here is to show Israel that God would not choose another in spite of her sin, to prove his faithfulness in keeping his covenant promise. You must remember, brothers and sisters, that as we read this account of Hosea and Gomer, that their relationship, along with its difficulties, was meant to show the people of the then ten northern tribes, making Israel, their own state or their own condition before Almighty God. In order to remind you, Hosea represents God in this parable, as it were. Hosea represents God, and Gomer represents sinful Israel. I hope you understand this. I want to make this clear as we, as we come to verse 4 now. Let's read together Hosea chapter 3 verse 4. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, and without teraphim. Now, whereas in the previous verses we have seen Hosea speaking, in this fourth verse 
we have God once again himself interjecting as it were. The Lord God now speaks powerfully of days yet to come for these people, the ten tribes making up Israel. Yes, there was soon to come a time of captivity in Assyria for the ten northern tribes. However, brothers and sisters, I do not believe that this is the main thrust of the message here. Yes, God is speaking to them of punishment coming their way in the form of captivity into another land, in this case Assyria, away from the ability to bring sacrifices and offerings and away from the priesthood and their ministry as wicked and as corrupt as it was at that time. I won't go any further into that but if you read the background you will see just how corrupt and wicked the so-called priesthood was made up of all the base and corrupt people at the time. However God is also more importantly speaking prophetically of a time in their distant future. This time would be when Israel would be one once again. In other words, when all the 12 tribes as one nation, as it was under King David, as it were, it will be a day where the people had rejected their own Messiah, Yeshua, and as a result, both Jerusalem, the city and also the temple would be levelled to the ground. A time announced by the Son of God, the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus Christ himself, with these sad words. Matthew 24 verse 2. Matthew chapter 24 verse 2. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? looking at the buildings. Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now Jesus here and I am of course speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem, which included the temple by the Romans in 70 AD. Now this was to mark the beginning of 2,000 years of dispersion, persecution, pogroms and the Holocaust for the Jewish people. God would now turn his countenance upon the Gentiles from that point. However, he would never forget, never, never forget his covenant promise to his chosen people. And thus, on May 14th, 1948, the nation of Israel was re-established and the Hebrew tongue was heard once more in the land of Israel. However, brethren, the Jewish people are still separated from God as they as a nation do not accept their Messiah, Yeshua although many now do praise be to God, although many now do worship Messiah as messianic believers. Praise be to God. The day is coming though, and it may come soon, when all Israel shall be saved, as the Apostle Paul wrote. This is the day referred to in the final verse of this chapter, Let's read it together. Hosea chapter 3 and verse 5. Hosea chapter 3 verse 5. Afterwards shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Underline that last portion, brethren. And shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Brothers and sisters, we're living in those latter days. Brethren, we have now studied three chapters of the book of Hosea. 
as I said at the beginning of this study, this chapter is in the form of a parable, a living parable at that. Indeed, brothers and sisters, this third chapter as a parable sums up and concludes all that was said in the first two chapters. It is a powerful and somewhat scary parable, but one which is relevant not only for the people of Hosea's day, nor just for Israel as a whole nation today, but it serves as a dire warning to everyone who loves God and has submitted to the Lordship of Christ Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach. God is holy. God is righteous. God is faithful. But he is also just. As we have seen, he is a jealous God and not to be mocked. This is a message that was made very clear by God through his prophet Hosea in the three chapters that we have read and studied up to now. How much clearer could God have been in making his prophet marry a prostitute, have children with her, name those children as the things that he was about to do. And then through that marriage reveal his love by bringing that prostitute back to Hosea revealing the love that God has for his chosen people. I hope you've seen that this powerful truth brethren as we've read these three first chapters. It is a message that will continue as we progress through the book but these three first chapters are important to remember. This third chapter, this living parable between Hosea and Goma is important for us to remember because it reveals God's everlasting love for his people but also his jealousy over his chosen people. However, I hope that it's now made clear, brethren, that it is one thing to enter into a relationship with the living God through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. It is quite another thing to maintain that walk with him according to the high standards which are demanded. The standards which God expects for a walk with him with his son are high indeed it is something which the lord jesus himself addressed to his followers and his disciples in the following scriptures turn with me now as we head to the end to luke chapter 13 if you will luke chapter 13 we're going to read from verse 23 to verse 30 Luke chapter 13 from verse 23 to verse 30. Let's read together verse 23. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate or the narrow gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut the door and you begin to stand without and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us and he shall enter and say unto you, I know not whence you are. Then shall you begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, 
I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are last which shall be first, and there are first which shall be last. Praise God. The point to take from this and from other scriptures where Jesus speaks about the narrow gate and the narrow way is that it is one thing to enter through the narrow gate or the straight gate as it's called. It is quite another to maintain. It's another thing to maintain your walk along the narrow path. The way that we walk on this walk with our Lord to that prize at the end of the marathon is a narrow path. Sometimes we, as did Israel, forget that there is also a narrow path to walk once we get through the narrow gate. So we need to heed the word of God, brethren. Maintain our walk steadfastly with God. Keep our walk honest and true and pure. So brethren, until the next time, may God richly bless and keep you. Amen.